It's nearly, been nearly 30 years now and I've worked for about four or five different publishers on many different versions of Transformers. But the very original one for Marvel US and Marvel UK was what they called Generation One, which was the original characters, the original Megatron, Optimus and all those guys. And that is really the series that we, you know, has kind of defined my career. And we've brought it back with Regeneration One. That's now the continuation of that series that finished back in 1991 current publisher IDW has let us continue that on and take it up to issue 100 and finish it off. So in many ways that sort of bookended my time on Transformers. I've moved a lot into TV animation and screenwriting. I'm working on a series at the moment called The Matt Hatter Chronicles about a kid who jumps through a cinema screen to fight old movie villains. And that's really nice because I'm, as well as writing for that, I'm working as their sort of script supervisor and behind the scenes more. So I'm getting to sort of to know a lot more about the animation business. It's done very well for ITV, it was on CITV and Nicktoons and there's toys out next year and a new series, so it all seems to be taking off for Matt Hatter. The first animated stuff I did was for the Beast Wars animated show back in the 90s. And since then I've worked on a few other things like X-Men Evolution and Dan Dare and um, Alien Racers and a few other cartoon shows. But Matt Hatter, I think, will be my biggest body of work just because I've been involved pretty much since the thing started. Transformers! It all started right at the beginning because what Hasbro, the toy company, did when they had first sort of brought these toys from Japan. They were mostly unnamed, there was no story. But this was kind of the era post Star Wars where everything had to have a big backstory. So they went to Marvel US who'd taken their G.I. Joe toys and turned them into a comic and a TV show. And it was really Marvel US, a guy called Jim Shooter and then Bob Budiansky who laid down all the sort of groundwork, the Autobots and the Decepticons, the Civil War, you know, they, you know, they really kind of founded everything, Cybertron. So, you know, really I came in after that and just added layers to what they'd done and expanded it. And, you know, once the animated movie dropped in, we kind of got to grips with all those kind of future characters and started dropping those into the story. Well, there was a strange thing at the time. You know, we had the comic going and we had the cartoon series and the two were quite different. And the cartoon series had come up with its own origin of the Transformers. And, you know, we were never very happy with that. So when we saw the animated movie back in the 80s and the character Unicron was introduced in it, we just thought, wow, that's a great character. It would be much more interesting if the whole origin involved this Unicron character. So we just created a counterpart for him called Primus, who was the god of the Transformers or the creator of the Transformers and we sort of pushed it back into this huge mythological battle between the forces of order and chaos and you know made it a big sort of saving the whole universe saga instead of just you know quite sort of small scale on earth we just wanted to kind of make it a bit more cosmic and and you know put a big sort of Kirby and Lee-esque backstory to it because that's what I grew up reading you know, the comics of Stan Lee and, and it was always Galactus and the Eternals and these amazing sort of sci-fi concepts. So we really wanted to do the same for Transformers and make their origin something that the kids would just go, wow, that's incredible. You know, it kind of came from Japan to America and then we got involved in the British Marvel side of it doing our stories. And our stories were quite different to the American stories. They were a bit more like British comics were in the day. A bit sort of grittier and more sort of visceral and action packed. And, you know, we got to do, once the movie came out, we got to do our own thing really because we didn't have to sort of keep in line with what Marvel US were doing in their comics so much. <laughs> But something that really bubbled up and disappeared without a trace as far as the cinema box office was concerned 
but it just made such a huge impact on me and all the fans that it kind of kept going and it's still hugely popular. Behold, Galvatron. It was made between Marvel and Sumbo, and it looked it, it looked like what we came to understand as manga and anime. But at the time, we really didn't have much exposure to that, so it really was a bit of an eye popper, really, on the screen. Cyclonus. First of all, I mean, I never really bought him just as a sort of dumb character. In the cartoon show, he was just a kind of very dumb character. In the American series, he was a little more intelligent, but not so much. But, you know, I kind of really wanted to play it that he's dumb because that's just the front he puts up, and he's actually a lot smarter than he appears. Me Grimlock, no bozo, me king! So we tried to give him a few more layers, but what I liked about the character was that he, as opposed to the guys who were just good, you know, Optimus Prime, great character, but he's kind of boring to write for because he's just good, you know, he just always does the right thing. Yeah. You know, Megatron, he's evil, bad guys are more fun, but Grimlock walks that line somewhere between them. He's neither quite, you know, heroic or evil, so he's continually sort of tested, if you like, and I just find those conflicted characters much more, you know, interesting to write. Yeah, I like to take a character that you know, on the surface appears to be one thing and then you sort of scrape away and you see that they're, oh no, they're a bit more like this and oh, I didn't expect that. And, yeah. and you know, yeah, it's just nice to add layers to all these characters because some of them were just very sort of boilerplate. They had a motto, a, a, a kind of character, a gimmick, a weapon. And you know, you could then sort of expand on that. And with Grimlock, we just expanded quite a bit and he became one of my personal favorites. We, we did a lot of work to, to make, you know, sort of make their sort of these big concepts of order and chaos. You know, I don't know whether it was the movie, I think it's the movie that calls him the chaos bringer. And we just thought, well, let's, let's roll with that a little bit and, and, you know, expand on that. And if, you know, like I say, we've got Primus over here who's order and Unicron is chaos. But, you know, we did take a lot of that order and chaos thing and play it on and make it a bigger concept. and. And you know, that's very big in Regeneration 1 that we're writing at the moment. That whole theme, you know, because we're tying everything up, is going to sort of come in in a big way in the sort of final issue. Yeah. You know, it's a, some kind of resolution of this order, chaos, balance. The line of primes has grown weak in my absence, and thus you shall fall. That outcome is inevitable. But not on this day. Getting inside the character, getting, you know, exploring the character, making them more than they just appear is always, you know, some one thing I do as a writer. I try and, you know, get inside the character's head you know, surprise people, put them in different situations. So, you know, they have to, you know, take what their character is and change it, adapt it and move it on. And, you know, I think it's the underpinning of most stories. You know, you need your characters to move through an arc. You need them to evolve. And evolution is always a big thing in Transformers. You need them to evolve so they're, they're not just sort of staying put as those characters. They're changing, becoming, you know, more interesting maybe. <laughs> Dreamwave was a strange situation because on the one side Dreamwave were great. They really revitalised, you know, before the movies, before all the other stuff, they really kind of grabbed hold of that licence and rescued it from obscurity. But they really sort of got behind Transformers and even as about the same time I was working for Titan Books and we brought a lot of the Transformers comic stuff back into print and you know it was almost the sort of that year or the next that Dreamwave picked up the license as well and suddenly we had Transformers comics again. Big I don't think we would have 
almost what we have at the moment without them having started the whole ball rolling again. And they got people interested, they got sort of people buying it again. So, you know, that was a good side of Dreamwave. The bad side of Dreamwave was that they were not business people. They said no! They had to be declared bankrupt and a lot of people didn't get paid. So, you know, sort of, I think it was just, you know, I don't think they had enough sort of business now to, you know, take the boom times and salt stuff away for the, le the leaner times to come because yeah. they had lots of big sales to start off with. But of course, those plateaued out. And I think, you know, that was it. You know, they just didn't have a hedge against those leaner times. But the good thing, again, we got out of it was that IDW picked up the license and they really were a proper company. So, you know, they took it and they, they obviously realised that it couldn't just be boom all the time. And, you know, they, they, they had a very much sound business plan. They brought me on board to sort of revamp their generation one. So yeah, and I got on really well and still get on very well with IDW. So, you know, it's, it's you know, again, you know, it's a shame that Dreamwave, you know, sort of fumbled the ball, but IDW picked it up. And, you know, really they've now had the license for, for no, eight years, eight years, something like that. And, and really, you know, they they must be on the cusp if they haven't already of producing more Transformers comics than Marvel did. So, you know, they really have, been, you know, the, the sort of, you know, a great company to work for. Hey, was Benito happy at last? Back in 1991, we really had only two issues to wrap things up, so we had to leave a lot of things un finished, storylines dangling, and we kind of rushed a conclusion. The whole thing with Regeneration 1 is it picked up after the old series. So we started with issue 81, because the old one finished at 80. So we started at 81, and the whole idea was to take it up to issue 100 and finish it off in style. So issue 100 hits in March next year for the 30th anniversary. Open Gangnam Style! So that's when we're going to sort of finish off. It's a big giant size special issue. Both Andrew Wildman, who started the series with me, and um, Guido Gidi, who's an Italian artist, will be working on it. So it's a big sort of finale to the whole series, and it's really the grounding series. Like I say, that series that Bob Budiansky and Jim Shooter started off back in 1984, that introduced the whole world to Cybertron and Optimus Prime and the Autobots and Decepticons is the one that we're finishing off. So it's quite a landmark. And we also think it's the first Transformers series to have a finish. Not that you knew me back then, but it all comes back to me in the end. You kept everything. Transformers, there's plenty of other versions of it. IDW have got their own Generation 1 universe, which carries on. There's the movie universe. There's the animated shows. There's so many others. But this one, we're just capping off and saying, that's the end of that one. For me, it was a very big thing to, to go back, finish it off, tidy it up. It's nice that it's sort of all met up with the 30th anniversary. It feels very, you know, sort of serendipitous that it's all sort of wrapping up in that 30th anniversary. Till all are one. Till all are one. Andrew Wildman, who was the artist with me when the original series finished, he was very keen to come back and carry that on. And, and you know, we've, we've brought in other old artists like Jeff Senior and Jeff Anderson to, you know, to do little bits of Regeneration One as a kind of nod of the hat to all the, the artists who contributed. You know, Jose Delbo, who did a lot of the art for the original a series before I started writing it, you know, we've got him back to do a little sort of segment as well. So it feels like we're tying up a lot of, you know, kind of loose ends with it. I mean, I'm lucky to have worked with some really good artists, but, you know, I mean, I would say that, you know, of all of the artists I've worked with, Andrew Wildman and Jeff Senior are the ones that I've worked with the most. And, you know, I'm always happy to work with again. You know, it's not to say I wouldn't be happy to work with many other artists, but they're the two really, you know, I seem to know, I know them very well as friends. We've done an awful lot of stuff together. So when we work together, it's very easy. You know, when I write for Andrew, I don't have to, you know, over, you know, script the script. It's just, you know, I, I can rely on him to know what I want. Same with Jeff. 
we're working on a new webcomic that's coming out next year, yeah. Jeff Senior. And you know, when I work with him, I can give him a kind of almost skeletal outline and he works best when he has the freedom just to, you know, be artistically creative and come up with, you know, story innovations of his own. Mmm! Now that's delicious! Mmm, tastes so good! Yum! What are you doing? You know, I'm very proud of what I've done on Transformers, you know, I mean, Transformers has really sort of kept pace with and defined my career, so it's been very good for me and I hope I've been good for it. Grimlock, get your noodle out of my face! Me, Grimlock, love Cubs War Stories! And above and beyond Transformers, I suppose the thing I'm most proud of is a character called Death's Head, who was the creation of myself and Jeff Senior, and originally he went, he appeared in a Transformers strip. But pretty much right away we thought, oh, maybe he's, you know, we'd like to keep hold of him as a Marvel character. So we did a little one-page strip just to make sure he was a Marvel character first, not a, a Transformers character. And then, you know, when, after a while we took him out of Transformers and through a few other titles and into his own title. And, and that was 25 years ago. And, you know, he's still starring in the Marvel Universe today. You know, he was recently Kieran Gillen, who has been writing Iron Man was a big Death's Head fan from back in the day. So he brought Death's Head into Iron Man just recently. So, you know, it's very nice. It's, it's always gratifying to think that a character I co-created is still being used, is still in the mainstream Marvel universe. And, and so, yeah, you know, Death's Head will always, you know, I'll have a sort of vaguely parental feel about him. It's been so busy on the animation side. I'm writing some movie stuff. Um, I'm also writing a series of How to Train Your Dragon graphic novels. Dragons? IDW and I have sort of been working together pretty solidly since they got the license in 2005, so I'm sure that there will be something else. I'd always like to keep a bit of Transformers work going, a bit of comics work. a child of the late 70s, early 80s, so that pretty much defined my musical taste. So punk, new wave, two-tone, uh, electronic, you know, all that sort of stuff, I guess. And, you know, really, I haven't strayed very far from that. This Yeah.